Okay, I invite you to take a Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to flip back and forth from Matthew 21, 22, 23, 24, just kind of a general overview and an introduction to a mini-series on the Olivet Discourse. Uh, my original plans are do, to do five studies, and this will involve Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. I think they go together without question. So, uh, of course, the, uh, the uh, controversial one, the important one, is Matthew 24. So I've titled this teaching, This Old House Was Condemned. The uh, the Olivet Discourse is found in the Synoptic Gospels. What are the Synoptic Gospels? Those are the Gospels that kind of look through the same eye, their same sink. What are they? What's their names? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? So you'll find the account of the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, 1 through 35, Mark 13, and in Luke 21. So we've got a rather long introduction, and then um, we're going to look at some scripture. Uh, when Jesus goes into the temple on Monday, after the Sunday that we call his triumphant entry, or we call it something else in church calendar, what is that called? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Uh, so after he enters Jerusalem, on Palm Sunday, he goes in the temple for a brief moment, and Mark eleven twelve says he leaves the temple and goes to Bethany, which is a couple of miles away. Then on Monday morning, he comes back, and when he enters the temple on Monday morning, he starts the initial wrecking of the old covenant house by overturning the money changers, tables, and chairs. And then he gives a reason for this action in Matthew 21, verse 13. Look, look there in your Bibles. Matthew 21, verse 13. Uh, I have your notes, so I didn't put it in there, so you need to look there. It, it said, and he said to them, it is written, my house, what's he referring to? Temple. The temple. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then just before he leaves the old, old house, i.e. the temple, for the last time, Jesus tearfully laments in Matthew 23, 38. Look there. Matthew 23, 38. See. And when he used that word see, it doesn't mean like, okay, open your eyes and see. It means, do you see what I understand? I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Do you see what I'm saying? Which means, do you have insight? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Your house, what's he talking about? Temple. Temple. Your house. He doesn't refer to it as my house anymore because really it hadn't been God's house for a long time. Ark of the Covenant had been gone. God's presence hadn't been there for several hundred years. It was a... It was just a shell of what it was supposed to be representing. So he said he calls it your house is left to you desolate. And although the magnificent temple had been hijacked by a bunch of charlatans and thieves, it was about to be about to become totally obsolete and condemned and listed in the scriptures as obsolete, no longer useful, a shadow of which the true substance had come. Don't miss that. It's very important. Now pay close attention to Hebrews 8.13. I have that before me, so you don't have to turn there. But please make note of it in your notes. Hebrews 8, verse 13. Here's what it says. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. What's he referring to? What's the first? The Old Covenant. We call that the Old Testament. The, he's made the first, the Old Testament, obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So this old house was destined for demolition 
because it was going to be replaced by what it signified. It was a shadow and the substance had come. So the priesthood of Israel, the temple in which the priests served and all the rituals and sacrifices of the law which they performed were about to be ended. Why? Because they were shadows of the substance that had now come. And who was the substance? Jesus. Jesus. In Jesus, the true Israel and the true temple of God had come. So now the destruction of the corrupted temple and the apostate leaders and nation was being initiated just as Jesus had predicted. Now, we get into the controversial part. By the way, Matthew 24 is very controversial in his interpretation. And I don't mind getting into the controversy and employing Wade's rule, number one. You have every right to be wrong. To be wrong. <laughs> and in my humble and normally accurate, accurate opinion, <laughs> so you can see how humble I am. Those of you who are watching for the first time, don't stop. Keep <laughs> continuing watching. Uh, however, there has arisen an eschatological view. Big word. What does that word mean? Well, it's made up of two words. Eschatos means last, and the, the, the ending means the study of last uh, times, or a view of end-time events. So there's arisen an eschatological view in the last 200 years that has asserted that although the old house was destroyed in AD 70, a third temple and probably a fourth temple must be rebuilt, and it's believed that ours, this generation existing and alive now, will see that happen. But in my humble opinion, nothing, now pay close attention so you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Nothing has been done or nothing has done more to impede the extension of the kingdom of God, to diminish the confidence of the power of the gospel to save nations, and re-empowered a defeated and disempowered devil than this view officially known as dispensational premillennialism. Not premillennialism, it's been around since the second, third century, but dispensational premillennialism, which is the most popular prophetic interpretive view of our times, and it's been around for about 200 years. And again, I don't say this to depreciate the lives and the ministry of great men and women of God. Uh, in, the, in fact, in the first 15 years of my life, uh, this was my position. I was an ardent defender of this position. For, for example, my first Bible, my first Bible was a Schofield reference Bible. I mean, King James Schofield Reference Bible. Why? Because of all the footnotes. And he was the foremost promoter of dispensationalism. And that Bible was written for the first time in 1909. My first sermon was on the second coming of Christ. And that, I exhausted the entire eschatological content in 15 minutes. Fortunately, I got over that because I promised I'd never run short again, and I never have. <laughs> so my first Bible, Schofield Bible, my first sermon, second coming, the Bible of choice at my ordination, Schofield Reference Bible. I still have it. Uh, so why? Well, like I said, because the footnotes made it easy to frame everything within seven dispensations or periods of time that covered everything from creation in Genesis to consummation in Revelation. I included in your notes a, a, a copy, a diagram of what dispensationalists believe. Here, here you'll find it. You can find this on uh, Google. And if you just look there very quickly, you see the seven dispensations presented by the dispensational premillennialist. Okay? So you have the age of innocence, the age of conscience, of human government, of promise, of law, of grace, which supposedly the age that we're in as the church age, and then number seven, the kingdom age, in which Jesus returns in 
enters a rebuilt temple, sits there for a thousand years, and rules the world uh, in righteousness from uh, Jerusalem. So that's basically you have the <clears throat> the dispensational position. Dispensational eschatology teaches that in the last times or the end times, which those who hold that position assert we're that we're in that, which there's no support for. They teach basically that Satan will outsmart and defeat God's gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and God's Spirit-empowered people. Apparently, in the complex, twisted, prophetic outlook of dispensationalism, God's plan of salvation, Jesus Christ conquering death on the cross, and Christ Jesus sending the Holy Spirit to empower believers is insufficient to overcome the wiles, the cleverness, and power of Satan and his hell-bound band of fallen angels. So when the end times church is about to be faced with entering an all-encompassing Satan-inspired, quote, tribulation period in which the Jews in Israel have been allowed to rebuild a new house, a.k.a. the temple, in the middle of the great tribulation, a figure known as the Antichrist, breaks the covenant he made with Israel, seats himself in the temple, and begins a persecution of the Jews that'll kill two-thirds of them. But before the tribulation erupts, Christ, in a last-minute intervention, suddenly snatches believers off the face of the earth in a secret rapture. Later, after a seven-year period of hell on earth called the tribulation, Jesus returns, the second coming is referred to, to rescue a remnant band of defeated believers who have come to believe the gospel after the secret rapture incident and realizing the true identity of the Antichrist. Jesus then seats himself in the temple in Jerusalem and rules the world in peace for a literal thousand years. Now today, multitudes of good men and women, especially in America, believe and teach and write endless numbers of books and make endless numbers of broadcasts and movies based on the dispensational, futurist views of Scripture, especially the Olivet Discourse as found in Matthew 24. In his latest book titled, The World of the End, <clears throat> Dr. David Jeremiah, a good man, I love him, articulate, <clears throat> but I disagree with him 100% on his prophecy. He says concerning this book, which is one of many that he's written, quote, every sentence in Matthew 24 is addressed to you if you're a child of God through Jesus Christ. Now there's a Greek word for that. Hogwash. Hogwash. It's not. Matthew 24 is not addressed to you and me directly. The book of Matthew is written by a Jew to the Jews about a Jew, about a Jew named Jesus. So here's rule number one of interpretation. The Bible was not written to me or you. It was written for me. So th th that first sentence is wrong. They are for your information. That's true, and anticipation and motivation. So what he should say is they were written to the first century Jews, but you can have application from these. Pastor David goes on to say, listen to this statement. We may not be the end of the world, but we are at the world of the end. What does he mean by that? By this, he means that we are the last generation, the one that will see the end of the world. That's what that means. He declares that we, quote, are living in a time when Bible prophecy is intersecting with our culture, technology, unhinged morality, and a worldwide strife as never before. Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins wrote the most popular biblical prophecy series ever written so far. The series was titled Left Behind. I have a number of these books. Now, this one was written by, actually it was written by Jerry Jenkins. Tim LaHaye never read a, wrote a word. <laughs> but Tim LaHaye had the name. Jerry Jenkins was a nobody. But nevertheless, this series has sold for at least 85 million copies, and that's not including the video series and movie. 
Then there was prior to that, Hal Lindsey's famous, the late great planet Earth, that sold over 80 million copies. Now, it, 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 and there are more. Here's a John Hagee, the end of the age. The countdown has become. Dr. Michael Youssef is the end near. And of course, he says, yes, it is. And then there was a billboard. This is He paid for dozens of these across the land. This was Harold Camping who believed that 19, uh, he said, Judgment Day is coming, May the 21st, 2011. I, I got this wrong. This was the, uh, the, uh, another, another group, Radio something, can't remember what it was. And then here's John Hagee, uh, his book and videos, The Coming Four Blood Moons, and that'll be the end. Well, the four blood moons came and they went, and we're still here. So the rapture on the 23rd of September, 2015, has been refuted and goes down in flames like so many, like all of them right prior to that. Now, it's commendable to note that many have been genuinely saved because of these writings. That's what they argue. Thousands have been saved, and many have. But in my opinion, now listen to my opinion. That's what you've been getting. I'm going to give you scripture eventually to support my opinion. Nothing has weakened and discouraged the church as has the position of dispensational premillennialism. The, obs the obsession with the end times and the fear that the worst and final period of human history is in our lifetime has paralyzed the church in America. Popular preachers and prophecy experts constantly predict and then revise their predictions concerning the second coming of Christ, especially as is seen in the Olivet Discourse as found in Matthew 24 and Mark 3 and Luke 21. Waiting for the so-called secret rapture and the coming of a thief in the night has caused many, Christian, many Christians to assume that there is little time, if any, for long-term plans. Numerous popular leaders in the church have hiked their sensational claims about the future, some of them, not all of them by any means, enriching themselves and leaving the church of Jesus Christ impoverished. Careless and sometimes dishonest exegesis of the text of Scripture has led to serious theological errors and misrepresentations of the message of Jesus. They're saying, time is running out. Man the lifeboats. Forget about changing anything. Don't be left behind. Now, this contrived scenario sounds very exciting, but does it make sense biblically? Does this really sound like a Christ-conquering gospel message? Didn't the Christian era begin with Christ's death, conquering Satan on the cross? So Christ conquers Satan on the cross, but then supposedly, a couple of thousand years later, Satan defeats the Holy Spirit gospel, uh, the Holy Spirit-empowered gospel, with some chump the devil empowers called the Antichrist. Did Christ really set up and empower his church, his bride, to be defeated by, by Satan? And the only hope for us is to be snatched out as quickly as possible so plan A can get back online, which was his original dealings with the Jews. Listen, the, there's no plan A and plan B. There's only one plan. There's never been but one plan, and it's plan A, and it includes an olive tree of which Abraham is the trunk. The Jews grew out of that olive tree in Romans chapter 11 and got cut off because of their apostasy. Gentiles were grafted in, and later on, some more Jews are going to be grafted into that one tree, that one body, that one bride, the people of the living God. That's my humble and sometimes and normally, and in this case, accurate opinion. Amen? Amen. Okay. Well, not many people that, that, that uh, would watch this would say amen. That's okay. Most of my friends hold an opposite position to me, and we're still friends. We just don't talk about this. They think I'm a heretic. It's okay. I'd return the favor, but we're friends. <laughs> so, uh, after this long introduction, I'm going to give the outline. We'll follow. 
in teaching Matthew 24. First of all, we're not going to begin there because it doesn't begin there. Now notice my alliterative habits must always follow through. Number one, fierce execrations. Mikey said, what is that word? I haven't heard it before. Well, it, it simply means curses. Fierce curses assuring the end of the age. Secondly, we'll look next week at false expectations of the end of the age from Matthew. That's, I got in mind M-Y, it should be M-T. Matthew 24, 4 through 13. And then firm observations of the end of the age final devastation, and then future culmination and the eternal ages. So let's look at the first part. Fierce execrations or curses assuring the end of the age. Now, go back with me because I'm going to skip a lot of stuff in my notes. Go back and let's see the unfolding narrative beginning in chapter 21 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 21 Jesus enters into Jerusalem in fulfillment of prophecy on a donkey, verses 5 and 6. The crowds are shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. The whole city is moved, verse 10 and 11 says, Who is this? And then they answer in verse 11. Verse 12, then Jesus went into the temple of God, drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple, overturned the tables, of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. Then some people get healed. They go out. Verse 17, chapter 21. Are you following with me? Yeah. Then he left them, went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Next morning, he comes back into the city. That's Jerusalem. And on the way, he was hungry, saw this fig tree. And it, it didn't have, it had leaves, but no figs. And so he cursed it. It's not a damn you. It's just simply said a statement of authority. Let no fruit grow on you ever again. And so the disciples marvel when it withered so soon. And then he gives a, a lesson on faith. If you had whatever you ask in prayer, believing you'll receive. So he goes into the temple, verse 23, and the big guys come to him. The chief priest and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching about what authority he was using to do that. Then he proposed a question to them concerning the baptism of John, and they knew that they, were, they had a conundrum before them. If they answered one way, they'd be in trouble. If they answered the other way, they'd be in trouble. They said, we don't know. We, I, we can't tell you. And Jesus said, verse 27, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And then he gives two parables in Matthew 21. And they are directed against the leaders of the of the of Judaism, the, the the Sadducees, the scribes, and the Pharisees. And it's about two sons. And the first son it represents the leaders and 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 Judaism as a whole. And they rejected the son. The second after reject or the first after rejecting believed. The second didn't. I got it backwards. And then he said. John, verse 32, came to you in the way of righteousness. You did not believe, but tax collectors and harlots believed in him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Then he gave the parable of the wicked vine dressers, where the owner of the vineyard sent a number of workers. They drove them out, killed some. Then he sent his son. The owner of the vineyard sent his son, and they killed him. And he said, well, what are they going to do? What's going to happen when the owner, they will respect my son, verse 37. Verse 38 said, let's seize him, kill him, take his inheritance. And then Jesus said in verse 42 and uh, through 44, notice closely. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now, keep that in mind. We're going to be talking about stones, about rocks. Because when we go in Matthew 24, he said, you see all these big, massive stones? Not one's going to be left upon another that won't be cast down. And they're going to be cast down because they're going to meet the cornerstone. And that building doesn't have the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. Notice verse 43. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God 
will be taken from you. Who's the you he's referring to? The nation of Israel. It'll be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Did that come true or not? Who, who, who did he give it to? The Gentile, the people of God. That's found in 1 Peter chapter 2, by the way, where Peter says, you are a whole, you're living stones, a holy priesthood, a holy nation. So it was given to the believing people of God, which began with, was originally Jews. The first part was Jews. And then he says, verse 44, whoever falls on this stone, what stone? Jesus, the cornerstone, will be broken. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. If you don't fall on it in brokenness and repentance, eventually it'll fall on you and crush you to powder. And then he continues his teaching. He gives in chapter 22, the parable of the wedding feast. And then after the Sadducees, who were the primary leaders of that time, had already been put down, embarrassed, then the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees were the liberals. The Pharisees would be considered the fundamentalists. Now listen again. These groups, we denounce them today. And if I called you a Pharisee, you would be offended. But in Jesus' day, if you were called a Pharisee, that was an honor. It was an honored position. These were the highest and the best of the leaders of Judaism of its day, especially the Pharisees. They were considered the not right-wing fundamentalists and left-wing. No, they were center. They were, they were considered the people that represented Yahweh, Jehovah. But that's not true. So they were counterfeits. So in the first part of 22, the Sadducees are put down. And then the Pharisees come along. Verse 15, trying to, notice what it says. They plotted how they might entangle him. So they brought up a thing about taxes. Jesus dealt with that. Sadducees come back again. What about the resurrection? You see, they didn't believe in a resurrection. Jesus tells them in verse 29, you're mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And then in verse 34, the scribes, the, the Pharisees, and, and a lawyer, that's, a, that's a, 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 a religious lawyer, not our kind of lawyer. So they're called in the authorized version, scribes. Uh, they came and said, which is the first commandment? And then after that, notice verse 1 of chapter 23. I'm just walking you through, and I'm skipping most of what my notes are all about. So in verse 23, Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, and he said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Because of that, what they tell you that lines up with Moses do, but don't follow their practice because they, pra they preach, but don't practice. And then he begins one of the most excoriating, one of the most damnable, one of the most what, what we'd call is just give them a good skinning. That's, that's, that's hillbilly talk. Uh, just skin them alive with the word. And he did. It's, it's, uh, in fact, they're in, the, in the King James and the New King James, there are eight woes, an octave of woes. There are only seven in the ESV. If you have the ESV, look at verse, uh, verse 13. You see it? Woe to you, scribes. And what's the next verse? What, what's the number of the verse? 15. Uh-oh. There's not a 14. Uh-oh. What happened to verse 14? Well, the later uh, transcripts, the later manuscripts, do not have what verse 14 says. The authorized, the King James, puts verse 14 in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. The NIV the, uh, the ESV, the RSV, leaves it out. So it goes from 13 to 15. <laughs> you, some of you have never seen that before, right? 13 to 15. So anyway, I have my authorized New King James Version here, the same one uh, Paul used, 1611, King James. <laughs> I love the King James. All my, all my memory is done. And, and I, I'm, I'm poking fun, obviously. Forgive me. <laughs> but 
But there are eight woes there. And these woes, listen, woes used a number of different ways in Scripture. But the way it's used here is, is an execration. It's a curse. It's the, because, you see, Jesus was the prophet of God. And a prophet really, in the Scripture, was a prosecuting attorney. He prosecuted the terms. He represented the covenant of God. And he came from God as a prosecuting attorney to arraign those who were breaking the covenant. Read the Old Testament again in that light. It's, you see all those things, that, this is going to happen and this is going to happen. These are prophets saying, I represent, as a prophet, I represent God's messenger. And this is the message. You've broken the covenant. This is what's going to happen. All of God's dealings are in terms of covenant. We are a covenant people. Now, a lot of dispensations say the new covenant hadn't even been initiated yet, but that's, that's bad theology. We are a new covenant people. All right, so he enunciates all these woes, but I, what I want you to see is the way he ends because I'm going to let this lead into the first few verses of Matthew 24. Look at verse 37. Jesus is getting ready to leave the temple for the last time. And here's what he says. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Now listen to verse 38 again. See, your house, the temple, is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then, it's a continuation, Matthew 24, then Jesus went out, went out for the last time and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple and Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And so they went out, went down the hill, across the Kidron Valley, and up onto the Mount of Olives. And from the Mount of Olives, you have a perfect picture of the Temple Mount area. And sitting there, on what is now the Holy of Holies, because the Holy of Holy person, Jesus, is sitting there looking across at the unholy place that's been vacated by God because of their covenant-breaking uh, sins. His disciples, look at verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So, uh, notice the, the high priest condemns the old house to destruction. Jesus said all these things, referring to the old house, the temple, is going to be torn down. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus accuses Jerusalem, the holy priestly city, of stoning those sent to her. He then states that not one stone will be left up on another in Herod's temple. So Jesus is the rejected stone, and he became the first stone of the new building. And here's the picture. The Jews have used some stones to build up their anti-temple and others to kill God's true temple people. He, he said on this generation, all the blood, all the way from Abel up to this time, righteous people are going to be you're going to be held accountable for. God's people are buried under piles of literal rock, stones. This is going to be reversed. Their precious temple will be reduced to a pile of rocks, and God's people will be built up as a spiritual temple, living stones with a rejected rock called Jesus, who has become the cornerstone of this new temple. So from this, we see that Jesus is not merely pointing to the temple and saying, do you see this? It'll be torn down. Rather, he's asking the disciples 
if they really and truly understand what the temple is all about. Do they see why it must be destroyed? Do you see? Do you understand? One, it's outlived its usefulness now that Jesus has come. And two, that its present manifestation is a false temple. Now, you say, well, what's the big deal? Let me tell you what the big deal is, especially for a younger generation. It happened to me when I was young. I was totally discouraged from getting an education, going to seminary. Why? Because my mentor said, who was 12 years beyond high school in educational and academia, taught as an adjunct professor at a Baptist college, he, he told me, we don't have time. We simply do not have time. Jesus is coming in our generation, and we, we, we just need to do all we can to get as many saved as we can. So I didn't. Let me give you a testimony of a man who was totally paralyzed and terrorized. He's a dear friend. Lives down in Panama City, Florida. His name is John. I'll save him uh, any exposure by giving his last name. He said, I want to give a brief personal testimony of how biblical prophecy has impacted my life. I was raised in a Baptist church in Florida. I've sat under sound biblical preaching and teaching since I was old enough to remember. My mother was a spiritual leader in my home, and as such, I, I was always easily impacted by what teachings she was following. I remember during my high school years getting exposed to Jack Van Impey, Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, and their teachings. I was captivated by them. I remember the excitement in seeing what I thought was real Bible prophecy being played out in the morning paper that was being delivered to my parents' driveway. Now, as the years rolled on, I developed a listening ear anytime the television was on and heard Israel or the Middle East mentioned. I remember the surge of excitement in thinking the rapture could be just around the corner and we're going to be escorted out of here with front row seats to watch Jesus kick Satan's tail as we cheered him on. As high school years rolled into adult years, I had a natural desire to have a, a wife and a family. It was as if I had a, a split personality. One part of my personality was consumed with the imminent, imminent rapture of the church and the chaos that was soon to follow. Yet the other part of my personality desired to settle down, have a wife and family and grandchildren, leave a legacy. I knew that if I were to get married and have children, it would take time. Time, I thought, I do not have. I remember the anxiety and despair. I remember thinking, God was cheating me out of life. I asked myself, why couldn't I have lived at another uh, time, a different time in history? I also aspired to give my life wholly for Christ, living for his glory and the advancement of the gospel. Those aspirations were always cloudy and murky. I was burdened with how many years I had wasted knowing that we had only months, maybe even days or hours until the rapture. I read the entire Left Behind series, all 17 books, and knew for, the, for a fact that this was how things were, were going to be played out. I was convinced that in a short manner of time, the church would disappear, airplanes would crash from the sky, cars would crash into each other, and all hell would soon break loose on the earth. I became glued to my computer screen, reading prophecy news reports, even getting up-to-minute emails on the latest development. Up to the minute. It was around the year 2012 when God gave me the opportunity to go on my first mission trip. It was during that trip that I met a man named Wade Drimmer, <laughs> who for the first time in my life challenged my views on eschatology. I'd never heard such things. I thought he was a heretic. However, I didn't immediately give up my current view, but during the course of three years, this man gently and biblically challenged the doctrine of dispensational premillennialism that I held so dear. He sent me books and directed me to teachers of the word who held to a different view in eschatology, of which I didn't know there were those kind of books. It taught me to read the Bible differently. It encouraged me to engage in the fight, contend for and share the gospel, and make disciples of all people groups. 
I remember Wade telling me on more than one occasion, what's the point of attempting to start a business if you're going out of business tomorrow? Unfortunately, that's what most Christians today believe. We're going out of business any minute now. The church will be rescued because it couldn't make it in the world. The devil is stronger than Christ's church and only an emergency rescue by Jesus himself will save the day. It causes Christians to live in fear and defeat instead of going on from victory to victory. He said, eventually, with conviction, I repented of my obsession with escapism and neglected my Christian mandate to make disciples of all people groups. It encourages me to think that when Christ returns, and I do believe he's returning, he will return to an all-conquering, all-prevailing, all-beautiful bride and the gates of hell shall not prevail against that bride. Amen.